Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eshed Galore. I work for Huawei. Um, and I will be talking about uh, the uh, crossing the hybrid cloud with Carbo. So let's start. So I'll talk a bit about hybrid cloud and hybrid cloud migration. Um, so hybrid cloud is uh, basically defined as any kind of uh, combination between the on-prem and the uh, some service that you run on public cloud. Even if you're just using Gmail in your business, that's already considered officially as a hybrid cloud. So where do we find hybrid clouds? So we find hybrid clouds in the traditional data centers. We find them in the private cloud, and we find them in the public cloud. And uh, what are we using hybrid clouds for? So we're using hybrid clouds for uh, services, like um, taking ex external computation, for example, machine learning, like Spark, text-to-speech, like uh, Amazon Poly, external email, like Gmail or Office 365, or even the deep learning like IBM Watson. We, we consume hybrid cloud in uh, platforms, like uh, plat platform services like uh, Cloud Foundry or AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Sorry. Uh, we have uh, orchestration engines like uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we have storage services in the cloud. For example, uh, external storage like AWS S3 or managed database services like uh, AWS RDS uh, or Google Bigtable or Spanner. Uh, we have uh, cold storage like AWS Glacier and so on. And we have infrastructure, compute network storage, classic uh, infrastructure service. Uh, we, have, uh, we are using infrastructure in use cases like cloud bursting where uh, the on-prem can start consuming services from the cloud when there's not enough resources. Uh, we use that for disaster recovery plans. Uh, or we use it side by side, like private and public together for increasing the uplink to the internet or just uh, saving cost. So let's look at the current state of the workloads. So we see that uh, basically the world now divides into uh, two kind of uh, paradigms. It's a traditional on the other one side when you have uh, uh, bare metal or virtual machines uh, in the VMware style. Uh, this is uh, characterized by having uh, everything managed by operations, by a dedicated team of operations that is managing uh, what we call pets, uh, uh, very specific uh, machines with names on it and uh, a, a static and constant uh, IP address and the, 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 the numbers are much smaller. Um, the traditional workloads are, well, it's actually not called workloads, are monolithic. Uh, you have one operating system and inside you have many services like uh, Java Enterprise Beans or, uh, or together with a database, together with uh, additional batch processes running, that's all packaged together in one image running inside the same uh, VM or bare metal. On the other side, we have the cloud native applications. That's like the new, new kid in the block. So workloads are containerized in Docker, for example. Um, they are dynamically managed they are orchestrated as cattle versus the pets that we see in the traditional uh, paradigm, and very reliant on microservices, or, uh, microservices or very oriented to microservices, which are decoupled and stateless, and basically are less uh, influenced when there is something going down. So extending to the public cloud, let's say we are an enterprise, we're a company, we have we have some legacy software, and we basically have three options to move to a public cloud or hybrid cloud uh, model of uh, using uh, resources. So on one side, we have the lift and shift, basically take the stuff, move it, run it on the cloud. Uh, on the other extremity, we have redesign. 
So completely re 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 rewrite everything, redesign everything as cloud native and go with Kubernetes or something like that. And in the middle ground, we have the refactoring, which is the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary approach. So I'll just touch on what, what each of these means. Okay, so redesign. So redesign the application to be cloud native, write it as microservices, continuous integration, continuous development, containerized, orchestrated, and everything that we know from Kubernetes. The problem with this is a slow process. You need to rewrite all the software. It's very expensive. It's very intrusive to your business. It's very pervasive to your, to your business in terms of development processes that need to change and skills that need to change and the way things are thought on need to be done in a completely new paradigm. And the, the risk is very high as well, of course, because you're changing all your business score and rewriting it. Refactoring parts of the application, just taking some parts of the application which make sense and move it, moving it to the cloud. So you, you do the necessary changes, maybe you rewrite, maybe you redesign, but just parts of the system, and some of it you just leave as is. Um, the problem is it, this, is, this takes time, and quite a lot of time. Uh, it's also very difficult for some of the applications. It's expensive. It's unpredictable. There are many stability issues because now you are taking something that works and you are making it basically like combining two different paradigms. This never works really well and the risk is high. The third option, the lift and shift, which makes maybe most, most sense if you want to be very quick and safe about it. Lift your application as is, just deploy it in the cloud. So it sounds simple, it sounds quick. It is quick. It sounds like it's low risk, but is it really low risk? Do you really know what, what's going to happen? This, do you, are you sure that your application is going to work, uh, work the same? When are you going to do that? It, costs, it, it, may, it sounds like it's cheap, but is it really cheap to do that? So it's not sure because it's inefficient. Uh, your application will not be optimized to run on cloud. You just take it and move it. So things might break and definitely will not utilize the cloud resources properly. And then costs start to pile up and businesses then move back to the on-prem because it doesn't really work as promised. So Carbor, Carbor is a, uh, is a big tent open stack project, which we started, I think it was a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, Carver basically does three things. It's, it, it exposes data protection API. It's not a data protection, it's not a backup software. It's not. It's a data protection API, which provides uh, plugins or a set of plugins or a, framework of plugins that allow you to, uh, to protect any kind of a protectable. A protectable is everything that you can think about in the OpenStack application that you want to protect, like a VM, like a volume, like an image, like your settings, your network configuration, each of these with any provider where a provider is a solution that you, maybe you're, you're buying from someone or maybe you're just using an open source or maybe you just write yourself. And protect it at any bank. A bank is where the data is protected. You could say, you could say it's, it's on the public cloud. If you're on the private cloud, then the public cloud is where you will basically protect your data. And the third thing is the data protection service itself, which kinds of running all, the, all this uh, workflow. Oh, okay, sorry, no, it's important to, to, to mention that uh, the data protection capabilities um, versus how today uh, a, a, um, data is protected are exposed to the tenant and not to the admin. So basically in Cobra we took this approach, we divided the, uh, the roles between the tenant and the admin and 
we see the admin as the person who actually owns the backup solutions, who actually pays the uh, subscriptions, so they know what they have, they know what they want to provide to their tenants, and the tenant is the one that decides what to backup, what to replicate, what to uh, protect, and where, from, from the options provided to him by the admin. In very many senses, just like the rest of OpenStack works. Now, so what, another thing what we say is that data, the data you want to protect, is actually bigger than just the data the application is generating. So just protecting the data, the data the application is producing is just backup, right? But what about the resource data, like network, like the server? What about the resource metadata, the configuration that you are constantly um, uh, investing in. So, data protection today is 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 just is mainly revolved around the, the the application data, but you know the metadata changes over time. So you can you can say that my approach is okay. I have a template like you know, I've written a heat template, and if something uh, breaks and my system burns in my site and there's a meteor, a meteor hitting my site, I just, you know, I already have backup for my volumes and I just run this heat template in the other site and everything will work, but that doesn't work because the system is more complicated than that. There is a lot of, I don't know, many changes that maybe I didn't, didn't, didn't synchronize between the sites, like uh, the, the, the versions of the software and the settings and the firewall settings that I found out that there was a port that I blocked and I forgot to uh, update it and things break. So we know it, it never works. So basically what you want is something that adapts and that takes like a constant notice of all the changes that happen and uh, treats your, your application, your deployed application, as an organism that changes all the time. Some highlights for Carbor. So I mentioned this before. It's uh, pluggable completely. That's, that's the whole purpose. We are not implementing the, the backup solutions. We're just creating the, defining the interfaces. Um, we can protect any, any open stock resource. And we offer, um, very versatile, you know, kind of uh, multiple uh, protection uh, providers can coexist in the same place. We are not limiting the uh, differentiating options that each, uh, each uh, protection provider, in this case, uh, uh, provides. So we are not uh, enforcing like uh, something like a lowest common denominator. Uh, we, we, uh, we enable through, the, through our plugins to give out the, to the tenant all the options that exist in the, in the products that are implementing the protection itself. So values for the vendor itself, the vendors, vendors can just have uh, standard APIs that they can use to, uh, to implement in order to uh, introduce their software into OpenStack very painlessly, as opposed to today where they have to implement many lines of codes across many components in OpenStack and follow up on the interfaces. Um, for operators, it's a possibility to provide the data protection service. This is something that we, th we, we see it as a very substantial service that uh, cloud providers today that use OpenStack are missing uh, a lot of, uh, um, let's call it services that help new customers to do onboarding easily into the cloud. So if the customer is not a cloud native software, most of them are not, how do you bring them on? So that's, that's one of the problems. So this is, this is something that can make this much easier to do because a customer can start by doing a DR, just a disaster recovery, uh, just using Calber to uh, protect, protect his on-prem on the public cloud and they can just use this capability in order to to switch, to migrate, which I'll cover in the next uh, few slides. So, uh, so I mentioned before we have uh, a few terms in Carbor, protection, protectable, uh, which is the items that you protect. This is one kind of a plugin. 
you have a protection, which is how to protect, copy the data, uh, create uh, uh, like a template from the data, from the insert, insert data into database and so on. Uh, and the backbone gate where, where is where you, where you actually put the data. So if you take a typical 3T application, and, and I'm purposely giving an example of a legacy application and not a cloud native, like a database a tier, application tier, web tier, and which goes out, which goes out, or which receives a communication from the from the cloud. Okay, so it seems very like almost trivial to to look at this and say, okay, what's the problem? I'll just recreate it every time. I just back up the volumes, but what Carbor does is actually looking inside and uh, realizing all the interdependencies with all the components that you see inside this. You have, you have the project, the, the OpenStack project, and you have two web servers, and each web server has a security group and a li Linux image. And you have uh, the, the web network. We saw we have three networks, a web, DB, and application. And you have a router. And in each of the other networks, we have a uh, another component, application server in the application net, a database server in the database network, and the database has image, it has volumes, and so on. So there is a lot of protectables. Each of these is, requires a different kind of protection, right? You will protect a, a VM image differently than you will protect the data volume, and you will protect the router different than you will protect security group, so on. So, the basic flow is in, you start with a protection plan. Protection plan is something that uh, built by the admin, but set up by the tenant, which he decides what to, what to protect. And then there's a protect, protect operation, which creates a checkpoint in the bank. A checkpoint is basically uh, a group of all the data that consists this, uh, your, your, your backup. And there is the restore operation whenever you want, you go uh, to the Carbor service, you put the bank uh, where, where you, you have be, you've been keeping your checkpoints and you can just restore it, rebuild the project from that. I'll skip these slides, um, just, re just leave them a few seconds so that they are being uh, uh, videotaped and uh, you can look at it afterwards. Okay, and jumping to the pr protection provider. So the protection provider is actually, um, it looks a bit complicated, but actually it's not. This is the selection that, you, that the admin can make from all the sets of, um, uh, let's say, backup software and uh, store and volume and, and storage options and everything they have and the back options and the, Let's say they have uh, S3 uh, for, for a bank, uh, for, for backing up your data. They also have Dropbox or something else. So they can decide which to use and can build a profile, which we call a protection provider, which is the mix and match of all the options. And this is what the tenant eventually can, can select. So you could look at it as a kind of a, like an offer or, or a, um, a plan like a subscription plan for what the tenant can actually use. Now I'll move to the hybrid cloud with Carbor. So the main concept is, so we already have this uh, back, backup or this uh, protection plan that keeps all of our application uh, protected. We can recover from that plan, from that checkpoint, whenever we want. When we get to the uh, uh, to the, the the point, the recovery point objective of the last uh, checkpoint that we took, and everything will be reconstructed as a single uh, snapshot in in the new uh, cloud environment. So we can do that, and we can use that in order to do migration. So basically, it means we will create a plan, 
mark the application that we want to move, we will protect it, we will create a checkpoint. The checkpoint will keep the data in the, in the bank, the bank is, uh, is already in the public cloud. It will save all the metadata, all the configuration changes, everything that we have put a lot of effort into stabilizing. And then you just go and restore it in a new place, in the public cloud. So basically it will look like this. So in the first step on the private cloud, on the application on the private cloud, we see it on the left. Um, just an application, it doesn't matter which, okay? There is a Carbor service running and then we have a bank which is defined by the admin somewhere. So this, the first step we do, we use the Carbor API in order to protect the application in its entirety, including all the settings. Basically, this will create uh, a checkpoint in the bank. The next step, the application is on the private, the checkpoint is on the public, right? What we need to do now is just recover, restore the application from the, from the checkpoint in the public cloud using the Carbor uh, service. So now we have the application running on both, but only the application on the private cloud are actually receiving uh, uh, you know, client requests from the internet. So the next step will be, this is, this is the next step, and the next step will be to just start switching external clients to the application running on the public cloud. So, you know, either with a DNS load balancer or just switching them all over. Um, it's entirely to the decision of the, the person that is doing the, the migration. So basically that's it. And um, we are always looking for additional contributors to the Carver project. So if you want to join us, we are welcoming new, uh, new contributors. And if there are questions, then I will be happy to answer. Um, if anyone wants to ask, just use the microphone over there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>